Okay, so before we get started with our talk, I want to really quickly just introduce our club. So our club is called AI for Action, and we host a series of guest speaker talks. And our website is at the bottom if anyone would like to check that out. And about some of our past talks and um, our aim. So we aim to introduce the different applications of AI and CS um, in the various areas to middle and high school students. And some of the past talks we have had is an introduction to AI. Um, I talk about machine learning and one about robotic manipulation by a CMU professor. And so today we have Professor Roger Dannenberg to give us a talk about the future of AI and music. And so we will continue to invite different professionals in AI and CS to give presentations on the different applications in the different areas. And so if you are interested in our talk series, you can sign up at our website and anyone who signs up um, will be notified on all of our following events. And then just a little bit of background our, on today's speaker, Roger Dannenberg. So he is an um, emeritus professor at CMU in computer science, art, and music. And he also received his PhD in computer science at CMU. He's internationally known for his research in the field of computer music. And his current work includes research on performances and integrating computers and live musicians, high-level languages for sound synthesis, and automatic music generation. And the smart music system that's based on his computer accompaniment research are used worldwide by music students. And he also co-created Audacity. And Professor Dannenberg is also a trumpet player and a composer, and he performed in many concert halls. And he has also co-composed the opera with George Sastre. What's, what's the deal with computers and music? It, it, for some of you, it may seem completely natural, and it, it always seemed really natural to me. I think there's a, just a human fascination with automation to begin with. And the creative arts are full of interesting challenges and something that's challenged computer scientists from, from very early days. Even though most computer science, I have to admit, is directed towards maybe more profitable activities or more practical activities, but but art and intelligence and uh, more uh, uh, far-reaching topics like that have always been a big challenge. And also, I just feel, and I think many people feel, a passion to create and explore. And music is really a wide open territory. So what is, what is computer music about? I think that you can, you can think about computer music as a uh, community of people that are drawn towards computing and towards music and have more or less these three general kinds of interests. So one is creating sound. This is something that has always been part of making music, uh, creating instruments, creating thinking about new sounds and computers are uh, tremendously flexible for that. Uh, people, of course, create music, compose music. Uh, musicians have always been concerned with music representations and music theory, and how is it that we create music of interest? And so computing comes into that. And the third area is recreating and extending music performance practice. Uh, once you have instruments and you have compositions, you still have to perform them. And computers have played a big role in, in music performance and production, I would say. So the other thing that helps to get a little perspective and understanding about what's happening in with computers and music and AI for that matter, is just this amazing development of computing power. So this is, this is a graph that only goes back to 1978 and maybe that seems like ancient history to you, but I was, um, where was I in 1978? I was, I guess in my first year of graduate study. So I already had a degree in computer science and on this graph, that 1978 computer is a VAX 11780, uh, and it has a power of one, whatever that is. So just imagine one. And then we look out today, well, this is not even today, 2005, 
we're looking at 64-bit Intel Xeon, 3.6 gigahertz. And how fast is it compared to a pretty substantial computer when I started grad school? And this 64-bit uh, Intel Xeon is, well, somewhere between 1,000 and 10,000 times faster. And it's sort of towards the top. So let's say maybe maybe seven or 8,000 times the speed. And by now, of course, this, was, this graph only goes up to 2005. So in the intervening 15 years, we've uh, increased in, in some areas, especially GPUs uh, for graphics processing and machine learning, we've, we've grown at least another factor of 10. So it's hard to even grasp what that means and how much has changed. And the other thing to think about is, well, if this is what's happened, uh, this is a clear trend over many years, uh, we expect that trend to keep growing, maybe not quite as fast, but uh, it's certainly, you know, we're not nearly at the limit. So computers today are just um, uh, um, tiny and uh, barely capable of doing anything compared to the computers that we'll see in another decade or two. Uh, and, and we see this kind of growth in computing over uh, years from, from the beginning of computing. This is sort of what computers look like in the, in the beginnings of computer music around the 1960s timeframe. People described notes in punch cards with notation that looked like this. So there, there were no graphics terminals or graphical interfaces. It was all punch cards. But pretty soon, around the 1970s and early 80s, uh, real-time digital instruments became available because the computers had gotten 10 to 100 times faster and electronics was much, digital electronics was much cheaper. So we had some early uh, synthesizer, digital synthesizers like this uh, uh, Fairlight synthesizer on the left. Uh, there were even synthesizers for personal computers. This is one that I used, uh, made a lot of uh, music with called the Mountain Computer Music Card. And uh, by the early 80s, Yamaha had uh, developed some uh, very sophisticated capabilities for making uh, very large scale integrated circuits and used them to build this instrument, the DX7, which was the probably the first really widely used digital synthesizer on the consumer market. It still cost about $2,000, but they were incredibly popular. And they had a, a port on the back that was a, a digital interface using a standard that came out called MIDI, which is still widely used today. And that enabled you to hook these things up to computers. So, uh, oh, this is also a, just another picture of a, a custom computer music instrument at the time. So this, uh, this ability to hook synthesizers up to computers enabled a lot of exploration in interactive systems that started in the 80s and it's still happening today. And these are some pictures of different kinds of interactive uh, devices. And the thing that I think is really interesting about this, and maybe this is the first place where I can mention artificial intelligence, is uh, what, what do you do with a, an interactive computer music system? Well, at first, I think everyone thought of these as some kind of enhanced instrument, like a hyper instrument or a super instrument that could um, use the computer to, to do instrumental things better. And the way I think of that, started thinking about interactive systems is, Here's a way that as a composer, so think of this as, as me, the composer, uh, but also a computer scientist, I can take my compositional ideas 
And rather than writing a piece, I can write instructions for producing the piece that I want, but I can have that piece respond to a, a live musician. So now musicians can interact with this sort of uh, composer, real-time computer composer. And that's interesting, but the really interesting thing is that whatever comes out of the system uh, goes back to the performer because performers are always listening and reacting to music that they hear. So as a composer, I can put instructions into this interactive system that will produce music that somehow guides the performer. So just like normally when I write, well, when I write conventional music, I write notes on paper and I give it to the performer and I say, here's your guide. I want you to play these notes. But I fully expect the performer to play to do something musical with it, to be expressive and make the most of it. So now what I can do as a composer is I can say, here's a program. I'm not gonna put any notes on paper, but I want you to, to respond to this program and whatever it does and try to make some music that way. So that's uh, that was some, some early work uh, that I did. One of the first things I did with uh, computers when I started doing research was work on computer accompaniment. <laughs> I see the screen just dimmed again. I don't know what uh, um, what's going on here, but I guess we'll just go with it. Okay, so, um, so what is computer accompaniment? Well, the idea is that if you're uh, a musician uh, like I am, and I'm a trumpet player, and I want to uh, uh, perform a piece. Usually trumpets don't play solo pieces. We usually play with, with other musicians or you know, an orchestra or a piano player or a band or something. And uh, if you, since you have to practice a lot, uh, you, you don't always have the luxury of practicing with a piano player or um, uh, an accompanist. And so wouldn't it be cool if the computer could actually play along with you and, um, and provide accompaniment? This is getting darker and darker. Um, I wonder, all right, let's try one other thing. Yeah, I'm going to stop sharing. Sorry, if you bear with me just a second, I'm going to try to restart my slides here and then we'll go back to uh, sharing screens. I, I turned off the other monitor that I have and I'm just gonna do this one. Okay. Um, yeah, so computer accompaniment. Um, so let me, uh, uh, let's see, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll skip the explanation because I sort of just explained it. And so this is a demonstration of, of one of the early computer accompaniment systems that I built, and this is me playing trumpet. The computer is listening to me play trumpet. It's following along in the score, which is in in the in the program. And as it, since the computer knows where I am and how it can figure out how fast I'm playing, and it can uh, read the score that it has and play an accompaniment through synthesizers. So here we go might be loud.
Okay. This is a demonstration of a computer. And it goes on. So uh, I'm, I'm going to jump ahead to um, uh, the next piece on this video uh, that, that shows what happens when I make mistakes. So here is um, uh, another piece following me on trumpet, but I'm deliberately making a lot of mistakes to create challenges for the computer. Okay. Um, okay, well, let me, uh, uh, at least it seems to be bright again. So let's, uh, so I was about to play this uh, demo of uh, the computer accompaniment system when I'm deliberately making lots of mistakes. So uh, here we go. Okay, so I hope that gives you some idea of uh, what <clears throat> computer accompaniment is, is about. And um, at, at the time this was done, someone told me, uh, you know, Roger, this is the first, uh, computer, first consumer product that embeds artificial intelligence. And I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. I never thought about it that way. And, I'm, I'm not quite sure it's the only one, but it was it was out there at a pretty early time and uh, in the in the 90s and uh, definitely an example of, of um, some artificial intelligence in terms of using um, uh, some kind of intelligent pattern matching and uh, rule based decision making to try to build a musical performance and adjust things according to musical human input. And so another example is, um, I'll, just, I'll just play a little bit of this. This is a more recent performance. It's not a great high resolution video, but anyway, the, uh, uh, this is a, a 20 piece string orchestra being played by computer and synchronized to a jazz ensemble of, of live players and let's see if we can let's jump into uh, oh actually I can start this at the beginning I can get close to it. so so oh sorry what we're what we're listening to there to is uh, the bass player string that's a, a string bass uh, right here who is performing kind of the lead or the melody and all the other strings that you hear are are playing along with him it's an orchestra uh, coming out of this this bank of eight speakers and then pretty soon the band is going to start playing so let's and and you'll hear them all playing together
Okay, so I'm going to uh, cut that kind of short because I want to get to a, a lot of other things. So uh, just to kind of sum up so far, what I'm, the point I'm trying to make is that we are interested in using computers to extend music creation and performance. And at least traditionally, that's been done through instrument design, through thinking about how to get computers to uh, perform uh, musical phrases, getting computers to uh, compose uh, parts and uh, do, you know, composition, so uh, music composition, and, and then how to put all of that together and collaborate with humans. So um, let's see. I think I, I have to play a little <laughs> of this. This is uh, just uh, sort of the uh, uh, comic interlude. This is a robotic, robotic bagpipe player uh, that I created with people in the Robotics Institute, where if those of you that heard Matt Mason, uh, last speaker on this series, he's uh, one of my colleagues at Carnegie Mellon. He did not work on this on this robot bagpipe player, but uh, a lot of other people in the Robotics Institute did. So I'm just gonna jump in and play a little little bit of this here. So I'm I'm not going to play the whole piece, but uh, and and this bagpipe, which we call McBlair, also plays traditional bagpipe tunes, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. I'll say a little more about music and robotics later. I wanted to put that example in there if I can get it to shut up. <laughs> um, okay, another another thing uh, that. I've been working on with AI techniques and music is trying to get computers to perform music more musically. And I think there's not time for a lot of details, but we can take questions later. But this is uh, some work where we took examples of humans playing from scores. So notes, you know, quarter notes, eighth notes, traditional kind of, of notation, which doesn't really tell you anything about phrasing or timing or uh, how loud to play or how to articulate notes. That's all a lot of, at least mostly that's up to performers. And uh, so the computer doesn't actually read the notation off of paper, but we just encode the information into symbols the computer can understand. and. Uh, but we also, so we not only provide the music to the computer, but we give examples of humans playing it. And the, the computer then uh, in a fairly big complicated system uh, matches up what's played in the score to what's, what it's hearing. And so it has, it learns or gets to listen to many examples of notes being played by, uh, by a human instrumentalist. And the computer can then build a model for how to perform these notes. And then we can give the computer a new score. And uh, with that score, the, the computer first uses what it's learned to develop control information to, that tells about articulation and timing and uh, amplitude. And then that control information goes into an instrument model, which the computer's also learned. It just tells it how to make sound that sounds right. 
and and then what comes out is is a performance. So this is um, an example that's performed by a computer from a score. I'll stop it there. So that's uh, hopefully that's obviously a bassoon uh, model that, that we created. Um, so another thing that I would like to point out about computer music and where we are is that everything starts in a research phase and that's illustrated here by all this electronics gear on the left, this is what a maybe a electronic music studio looked like um, many years ago, and and what do we have now? Well, you know we've really perfected a lot of ideas and made them simpler for people to use, and so now you can go into a music store and buy all of these electronic music components, you know, instruments like electric guitars effects processors that are in these handy little boxes, uh, patch cords, they're all standardized quarter inch plugs to connect in standard impedance and everything else so that everything's modular and you just plug it together. And, and musicians can now do all this stuff easily themselves and go play gigs with quite a bit of sophistication in terms of electronics and computing. Uh, because of the way things have been packaged and, and prepared. So a big advance over the old days where everything was kind of built from scratch and very customized and, and very technical and took a lot of engineering support. So we, we're getting to a similar thing today where experimentalists are building computer music systems with computers and synthesizers that talk to each other and that are interconnected and, and do very sophisticated processing. This is the Canadian Electronic Ensemble over on the left, just to kind of illustrate what, what things might look like today in, in an experimental computer music performance. And for me, I think the future is going to be taking these research ideas and standardizing them and making them modular and pluggable so that musicians can easily use them to, rather than putting together a guitar and an effects box and an amplifier and a speaker, I think musicians will be putting together uh, music systems at a much higher level. So you might bring a smart drummer to the gig and plug them into a, a control system to give them the time that you want and um, have some interactive ways of communicating the style that you're interested in. And so in the future, we'll, we'll have collaborative performances with, with live musicians and intelligent computer musicians that uh, are easy for musicians to configure and, and work with. Uh, I wanted to, I, you know, I think I'm just gonna, I'm gonna skip this and jump ahead to uh, this slide. And, and talk about another project that I've been thinking about. And it's not that we're actually doing this, this project, but it's very helpful sometimes to have a very ambitious goal, uh, a project that might take a decade or more. And sometimes these are called moonshot projects after uh, the United States deciding it was going to put a man on the moon and every many people at the time thought how is that even possible and no one really knew all the answers they knew it was going to be tremendously difficult and of course millions or billions of dollars went into that 
but it promoted a lot of, of research and new developments and new techniques. And um, the great thing about going to the moon is every, everyone knew what it was to go to the moon. And uh, so it was a very clear problem with a, a very objective measurement when you've achieved that, uh, that goal. And so for music, uh, my moonshot project is illustrated here. Um, as some of you may know of the Grateful Dead and, and Jerry Garcia, who passed away, uh, is, is still followed by or you know, appreciated by millions of fans. And the idea of this project is what if we could use artificial intelligence to somehow build a model or a, a replica or kind of a, a uh, digital persona of Jerry Garcia so that we could once again produce the music of, of Jerry Garcia in a live improvisational interactive setting the way the Grateful Dead used to perform. And so we, so what do we have? We have five terabytes of concert recordings. It's over 10,000 hours of Jerry Garcia's performances with the Grateful Dead. And we're interested in using machine learning and modeling to build sort of a, a virtual Jerry Garcia that you see over here on the right, and also use some of these techniques that I've been showing, hinting at for computer music performance to control this model uh, and help this model interact with live musicians. So that's uh, um, you know one possible future direction for music and artificial intelligence. Uh, so as we move our control from human to computer, uh, I believe artificial intelligence is going to play an increasing role. Um, and again, I'll go back to these, these different areas of music. So the first is sound reproduction or sound production, you know, musical instruments and creating new sounds and computers help with that. Uh, the other area or the second area is the whole idea of composition and scores and how do we represent music. And we've been working with uh, generative systems to compose music and we're still have a lot to learn about musical creativity uh, but but that's an active area for artificial intelligence and machine learning and music and uh, we've we've seen this progress from just building instruments which are in a sense interactive uh, uh, real-time computer music devices to building interactive systems. So I gave the example of, of the inter, you know, composing interactive systems that, that react to and are listened to by uh, live performers and, and then progressing all the way to uh, real music collaboration where you have uh, virtual computer musicians as well as human musicians performing together. So I think the, the future this is the future trend of music, and there's a very strong component of artificial intelligence in there. Uh, it may be clear kind of in this broad sense where things are headed, but I think the outcomes are always going to be surprising. And one of the surprises will come from just the incredible growth of uh, computer power, where things that are seem impossible to compute today are going to be uh, very easy in the future. So I'm going to I'm going to stop there and we can have some time for questions or uh, clarification, whatever you'd like. It's a quiet bunch out there. Oh, oh, I see uh, Eric has a hand raised. Eric. Uh, yeah, I was just asking, um, so in the future, how would AI be able to imitate like rubato and other forms of expressionism? Oh, that's a, uh, 
interesting question, interesting area. I, I can give you one good example because I had a, a PhD student uh, that did uh, his PhD thesis on expressive collaborative performance. So uh, first of all, I should explain what that means. Um, usually when we say expressive performance, we mean things like rubato and uh, articulation and just you know speeding up, slowing down, um, <clears throat> playing louder and softer, phrasing, every, everything that, that uh, maybe deviates from a mechanical performance of, of musical notation is called expressive performance. And then uh, collaborative expressive performance is, uh, well, first of all, collaboration or collaborative performance is kind of the new term for computer accompaniment. The idea being that, you know, the accompanist is not just someone who sits in the background and, and follows along, follows the leader, but an accompanist is, is really a collaborative partner. And so what's what's really happening is collaborative music making between, let's say, the soloist and the accompanist. So uh, expressive collaborative performance. What, what my student did mainly was um, uh, record a lot of pianists who were uh, performing duets together. And we recorded the timing and dynamics of each player and um, map those onto the, uh, the score that they were playing. And we measured the, the differences, like uh, when they played louder or softer, when they played early or late, when their tempo was increasing or decreasing. And then we used machine learning models to say, well, based on the input, which is everything you've heard up until now, um, perhaps the chord that you're on and whether the notes are tense or not, uh, what, what's the uh, rhythmic, um, what, what, is, what is the rhythm? Are the notes fast and, I mean, short? Or are they long notes? Um, are they in certain rhythmic patterns? So all of that information is, is sort of given to you. And then the, the challenge is, can you predict what this player is going to do next? And of course, each player is listening to the other player and being influenced by the other player. So there's that, that input as well. So it's a very complicated kind of system. And so uh, my student, this is Gus Zha, who's now a assistant professor at NYU Shanghai. Uh, Gus created a, used, uh, demonstrated that machine learning could um, get essentially a factor of two better prediction of the duration and the timing of the next note than you could get by just assuming that they're going to play at a steady tempo. And so, um, so that's an example. Uh, I'll just, maybe I should leave it there because I, I see lots of questions. So I'm just gonna, on my screen going uh, left to right, I see William Wang. Um, so how would a machine be able to interpret a musician's style? Because it's not like repetitive, the style, like, um, how would it be able to correctly, like, imitate it? Yeah, so, um, so the, the whole question of what is style is very interesting. And there's, there are, there are books on the subject. Um, let's just say that the style is uh, deviations from kind of a normal flat version of uh, either either music composition or music performance or whatever. And, and so the thing that makes a style a style, or a lot of what makes a style what it is, is the fact that it's systematic or that it's it's uh, it's predictable in a way. If you're if you're playing in a jazz style, and I'm I'm mostly a jazz trumpet player, you don't play notes evenly. You don't play a scale. Da, 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 da. You go do 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 do. And, okay, and so and every jazz player will will recognize. You know, they might not all do it the same way, but at least 
if, if I do that for a musician, they'll say, oh yeah, you're swinging it. It's kind of a jazz style. Um, and, and, and so it is actually predictable. And so machines are actually pretty good at at uh, doing prediction. If you have, if you kind of understand what the dependent variables are, you know, uh, the style itself is the main one, but then you can, uh, you can learn from examples. You can get machine learning systems to learn from lots of examples to predict what's what the output is going to be or what the timing deviation is going to be, where are the accents going to be? And, and all of that constitutes style. So that's, you know, that's, that's basically how style works. And, and uh, so there are certainly, you know, some, some really big problems like the, um, someone, someone might have a style of, uh, structuring an entire solo or, or, a, or a composition in a certain way. And these kinds of long-term structural things are, are pretty hard for machines to pick up on, because, partly because there just aren't that many examples to learn from. And so I'm not saying style is trivial or and it can easily be mechanized. I think some aspects of style are easily mechanized and the rest is, you know, that's what research is for. So um, let's, uh, I think Leo is next. Um, Mr. Dannenberg, so I just want to ask if, so do you know if there's any like college major that's related to what you talked about? Yes, um, there are, uh, well, okay. So for example, at Carnegie Mellon, um, we have we have music majors and we have computer science majors and we have electrical engineering majors and or actually it's called electrical and computer engineering um, all of all of which uh, sort of touch on different aspects of what I've been talking about and within those we have the the school of music actually has a uh, a new uh, major in electronic music. And so, uh, so those students are learning, I, I would say the big emphasis is on music because they are in a music school. Um, the more technical stuff, the, you know, machine learning and artificial intelligence work that I do is more in the domain of the computer science department. But we offer courses in computer music, we have a program called ID8, which is interactive, integrative design, art, and technology uh, that um, puts science students into a, a more uh, artistic program or a set of sequence of courses where they interact with artists and work with artists and do more artistic and musical things. And similarly in the ID8 program, uh, uh, musicians and artists uh, begin to take some technical courses and collaborate with with technical people. So I think any place that you go to college, um, you you can look for courses in computer music. You can take, of course, you can take just music courses and music backgrounds really important. And uh, you can take computer science courses and learn about artificial intelligence and uh, and machine learning. So to some extent, like I don't think you're going to find a pure computer music major anywhere at the undergraduate level, uh, uh, but there's, you know, all the components are there kind of spread out among different departments. Um, okay, let's, let's see. Um, I haven't been keeping a list here, so I'm just going to go back to the, uh, oh, uh, uh, yeah, let's let's do. How about Peter? Hey, um, a uh, quick question for um. So, I was wondering what like what would all this like um, AI like music technology? How would that affect like say future musicians like like job wise? Not not really job, but like um, how that would like how future musicians like their roles would change and. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. Good. <laughs> you know, tech technology has has uh, really created uh, havoc in in the music industry. Um, starting around the early 1900s, when when radio uh, first uh, began. Well, when was yeah early early 1900s? Uh, we had radio, and so suddenly people started listening to music at home, and um, and, and at the same time, uh, lots of jobs opened in studios for producing music, you know, live live music for radio programs, uh, and and of course, then when recording came along, uh, there was another you know big turmoil because people didn't need to hear live music so much, they could listen to music at home. But then that also created recording, a lot of uh, recording gigs for musicians. And the same thing is happening now that, that uh, well, first of all, you know, there's more music in our society now than there, there ever was in history. So there are tremendous opportunities uh, with, with uh, the, the thing that computers have done, uh, is is kind of democratized music production so that you, you no longer have to have a million dollar studio to make mm -hmm. uh, state of the art music and and music of the highest quality and and so that's really opened up um, a huge uh, kind of cottage industry of of uh, recording studios uh, music producers and also, the internet distribution has enabled people to to reach new audiences. Um, it's it's also had a big impact. Like the uh, well, certainly the the big name studios, the uh, you know Sony and Warner Brothers and uh, Columbia Records, and uh, some of those don't even exist anymore. And and they've uh, you know they have a very different business models and different ways of working. Uh, today, so uh, you know, I think it's it's both good and bad. But you know, I, I think the uh, in the future, what's what's going to happen? It's really it's really hard to say. Uh, certainly, computers are going to be more involved. Um, but I think the the music, most of the music that we hear is extremely competitive and produced by extremely competent people. Um, and it, to me, it seems like it's going to be a long time before computers are really operating at the, at the top, you know, 1% or 0.1, it's more like 0.01% of uh, the, <clears throat> the top composers, producers, and musicians who are actually Making the most uh, popular and the most listened to music, and and so, you know, I think all of these people are going to be adopting digital production methods and using computers and using a lot of intelligence from com computers. But it's always going to be um, artists in the drivers in the driver's seat um, using all of these tools. So, I mean, that's I can't really say anything. Uh, too specific because I just don't know, but that's uh, um, you know those are some thoughts. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you, um, Ashley. Did did you ask your question? No, not yet. Um, okay. I just thought your presentation was very you know it taught me a lot of things I didn't know overall. So thank you for that. And my question was um, like technically how. Um, I don't know how much you can say on this, but like how exactly did AI, did you use AI to like produce and learn from music? Because I know um, AI, like learning from numbers and like text and stuff, that's probably different than how it learns from sound. So I just wanted to know like how that works, kind of. Yeah. Um, so at least in the, in the early days, uh, uh, and and when I started doing you know AI and machine learning with with music, um, it's it's very similar to to what you've already learned about. So for example, um, I did some work on uh, style recognition, um, not generation, but recognition, 
And uh, I, I wanted to see if a computer could could distinguish some very different styles of, of improvisation. So I, I would play my trumpet and, um, for example, lyri play lyrically, play frantically, play syncopated. Um, uh, well, it's just those, that's good enough. So uh, three very different styles to me, but actually getting writing programs that could tell the difference between those, it was pretty tricky. And, and we used, successfully used some machine, early machine learning techniques. And, and the way it works is like you said, it, you can learn from numbers and sequences and simple sequences. So you have to get music into some kind of numerical form. And what we did for style was we took um, five second long excerpts of, of music. So we, we listen, listen to me playing trumpet for five seconds. And how do we listen? Well, we used some uh, actually off the shelf hardware to, to turn uh, the trumpet sound into notes. And it didn't do a perfect job, but it you know got maybe 80, 90% of the pitches right and it could detect onsets. So we knew when, when do the notes start and what, what are their pitches? So in a five second interval, we could count how many notes are there. Um, some simple statistics, like what's, uh, what's the average pitch? What's the standard deviation of pitch? What's the average duration? What's the standard deviation of duration? What's, you know, and on and on. So we, we kind of came up with every numerical feature we could think of for a collection of notes over a five second period. And we ended up with about a dozen different features, they're called, uh, which are just numbers. And so then from those, let's say 12 numbers, we tried to use uh, machine learning to build a classifier to say, just so just like you might have a image recognition classifier where you put in a bunch of pixels as numbers, we put in just these 12 features from our music as numbers and said, okay, um, this is an, these 12 numbers are an example of either lyrical playing or a staccato playing or syncopated playing. Uh, and so you tell me what it is. And, and so um, now more recently as, you know, machines are thousands of times faster and we have GPUs and people are beginning to actually look at audio signals as these, as numerical input. So it's just, you know, an audio signal is um, in digital form is just a bunch of, it's a bunch of samples, you know, maybe 44,000 samples per second. Although with machine learning, usually people cut back and do maybe 8,000 samples per second, which is more like telephone quality, but um, 8,000 samples per second is just a stream of numbers. And you can put those into machines and say, okay, I wanna, um, uh, you know, predict either, well, either learn to generate music that sounds like this or using these samples, uh, figure out what what's the musical genre or i mean there's all kinds of machine learning problems uh, so yeah so it's largely just a question of re reducing music to sequences of numbers one way or the other and then using kind of the same kind of machine learning that everybody else is doing on other other problems because it's all learning about you know learning patterns in numbers uh, Pat, yeah, uh, Patrick. Yeah, so um, I've done some work with music generation with uh, machine learning, and I was wondering what you thought would be the most like, um, I guess, efficient or effective technique or technology for music generation right now with machine learning. Yeah, um, good question. I, I've been working uh, uh, for quite a while now on, on music generation. Um, what can I say? For, first of all, uh, 
I think that uh, machine learning, uh, a, lot of, a lot of the machine learning that's being used for uh, composition is uh, pretty much off the shelf sequence learning. And there's a real problem with sequence learning in that uh, computers are, are good at learning stuff that they've seen before, or, you know, heard before, whatever, that, uh, that they've seen a lot of. And, you know, these, these patterns will come out. But what happens in, in music is um, a kind of hierarchical abstraction. So, uh, you know, if you have a musical phrase, da 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 that's, you know, that might be a phrase the computer has never seen before. And, or and maybe we've never heard that before, but it's really familiar because first of all, um, there's, uh, this rhythm is being repeated, da 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 da. And second of all, the the interval, not the intervals themselves. I mean, not the pitches themselves are being repeated. Every every little phrase is different, but uh, the intervals are being repeated. It goes up a step and up a step, da da da, and it goes down, da, and then up a step, up a step, da da da, and then up a step, up a step, da da da. So. So that kind of um, those kinds of relationships and transformations happen everywhere in music, and it's uh, machine learning currently does not pick up on those patterns very well at all. And so I think, so you know, I guess you know your question is is what's what's the best way to do it? And here I am telling you how it's it's really really hard to do, <laughs> and. Uh, so maybe, but that's that's my answer. Is uh, uh, what I, I can tell you what we've been doing. I mean, first of all, is we've done a lot of work and gotten really, you know, some of the almost the best results. Uh, not really using machine learning in particular at all. We built some probabilistic models that uh, incorporate all the music theory that we know of, about uh, how do melodies resolve, um, how, does, how does harmony work, um, uh, how does dissonance work, what are passing tones, um, uh, lots and lots of, of music theoretical ideas. And we're actually able to generate some, some pretty decent, uh, simple melodies. And, and so, um, you know, I think I think the systems that are successful are going to be the ones that uh, incorporate a lot of knowledge of of music structure and music theory, and it's it's not really we're still trying to work out ourselves. You know how how to use machine learning to do that. We we can write our own programs uh, that have a lot of knowledge about structure, but we haven't really figured out how to to learn to identify that structure yet. Um, let's go to Sunny. Uh, do you think computers will be able to create their own genre of music? Oh, that's, uh, that's one of my kind of favorite ideas that I think about all the time because um, uh, com composition, com composing contemporary music in, in well, what do I mean by that? All right, so so there's, I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with with popular music because it, it's it's everywhere, <laughs> and and you know we can't get away from popular music. Um, I'm I'm really much more interested in art music, uh, which is, uh, um, not in the popular sphere. So many of you may not have even been exposed to. Uh, um, to contemporary art music, but what what the um, composers who write modern works for orchestra, uh, they write modern works for for string quartets and uh, and chamber groups and and for electronics. Um, all of you know these composers, and many of them are academics because you can't really make a, a living. It's very hard to make a living uh, writing uh, contemporary art music, but but. The, these composers are uh, 
looking for new ways of structuring music and new new styles and new ways to think about music. So if you know, if you've heard atonal music, uh, uh, that's music that kind of rejects all notions of, of harmony and tries to achieve equality of importance of all uh, pitches, or at least the 12 pitches in the chromatic scale. So that's, that's an e example of, you know, extremely dissonant music that's based on just different principles. Um, it's more like trying to be dissonant instead of trying to be consonant, if, if you will. And, um, and that leads to a whole different kind of music. And, and uh, uh, many, many composers followed that, that path. And, and it's always been a dream of mine that if we could really understand enough about how music works, that maybe the computers could figure out some whole new structuring principles for, that you could build uh, music around. And um, it's, it's possible that people would hear that and say, wow, that is just the, the most novel, freshest, creative music. Like it makes sense to me, but I can't imagine, like how did you come up with that? And that's that's a real dream of mine, um, a, a really good. If if any of you re have read the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, there's there's a whole kind of running theme in that in that book about how uh, Johann Sebastian Bach was was really a uh, um, an alien, and um, uh, this Bach's music was just so supremely beautiful and original that uh, someone, someone took the manuscripts from this alien and transported them back in time and put them on the desk of Johann Sebastian Bach, who then plagiarized this alien music and you know, brought forth this just stunning beauty into the world that nobody could have thought of before. So I, I imagine that maybe someday there could be this uh, uh, whole new principle as, as if, um, you know, that would be as, as great as Johann Sebastian Bach or, or um, I don't know, you know, pick, pick your favorite genre of music and imagine if it never existed and a machine just kind of generated it out of logic. Um, so uh, on the other hand, you know, a computer might come up with music that um, is only, only understandable by computers because maybe the, the patterns are just too complex for the human brain uh, the logic just doesn't make any sense to us. And yet, you know, maybe it would be like provably in some sense a very interesting musical style. And that would, that would be kind of academically interesting and fascinating in, it, in itself. So, so yeah, I think, uh, I, I think that's possible. I think that would be a great demonstration of our, you know, actual um, achieving a new level of understanding of how music works and what is music, if we could somehow just generate new types of, of music instead of just imitating stuff that already exists. So sorry for the long answer. I'm just, it's, I think it's such an exciting topic. Uh, okay, so um, Ethan's got his hand up. Uh, um, hi. Um, so like, what is the actual work um, like when, you know, researching and developing these tools? Oh, yeah. Um, well, I think uh, there's, there's no simple answer to that, but um, uh, I think most computer science research is, is stuff that we are just, uh, the, the people are drawn to, researchers are drawn to, and uh, we do it because we love it. Um, it's not like a nine to five job where you, you go in at nine o'clock and say, okay, I'm gonna work on this problem and time goes by, oops, it's five o'clock, time to go home and stop thinking about it. You know, this is stuff that we, we think about all the time. Uh, what, I kind of lose track of the time, but today's Saturday, right? So I got up, I got up this morning and, uh, thinking about a problem I've been working on and thinking about bugs I was trying to solve last night. And, you know, so it's, it's just something we do all the time. And uh, one of the challenges is um, 
uh, finding support to do what you want to do. So, you know, in my ideal world, I would have some colleagues, I would have a few PhD students, and we would, we would have the luxury to, to work on all this stuff. In, in reality, um, you probably either work for a, a company that has products to get out, and so your research is a little more directed to making money, or you work in a university and you have more freedom to do what you want, but on the side, you have to, to teach and advise students and sit on committees and do a lot of other, other things besides research to, to pay the bills. Um, I've, I've recently become emeritus professor, which means I don't, um, I don't have to teach. I don't have to go to committees. I can do research all day long, um, every day if I want to. And the only drawback is they don't pay me anymore. Um, but I'm at a point where that's okay, and, and I'm, I'm having a blast. So I hope that answers uh, your question at least a little bit.